Hello everyone, Victor is here and in this video I want to go over a few practice questions where we don't know the mechanism to begin with and we need to determine that based on the reaction conditions. So quickly let's review the predictive model that uh, will help us to determine the mechanism of reactions. Here our main categories, we have the nucleophile only, nucleophile slash base, base only and poor base in the nucleophile categories. And of course, we also have our living group positions over here. I discussed this predictive model in more details in my previous video, so if you need a refresher, go ahead and watch that thing again before continuing with this one. So to make it a little easier to navigate this model visually, I also like color coding this scheme. If you don't have this scheme handy, pause this video, copy it down so you can work the problems together with me and have it as a reference. Alright, so here is the list of the reactions I want to look at today. As with all my practice questions walkthroughs, I suggest you copy them down on a separate piece of paper each, or at least make sure that you leave some space between the questions so you have space to work the mechanisms. Alright, are we ready to go? Here is the first question. And the first thing that I'm going to do, I will analyze this question using the model starting with the reagent. The reagent is a nucleophile only reagent here, sodium, that I have over here, that is merely a counter ion, so I don't care about that, that's just a spectator ion, so I crossed it out right away. So I have the azide, which is a nucleophile only reagent. I also have the polar aprotic solvent, acetone, which is a fairly typical polar A product solvent, so that's something that you should probably memorize. Then we have the primary alkyl halide, so all of these factors, if we feed them into our predictive model, suggest that our reaction is an SN2 reaction. Mechanistically speaking, SN2 reaction is a very simple reaction where the nucleophile comes in and displaces our living group in one movement. So as a result, we're going to get the final molecule over here and some co-products which we don't really care about. So here is the next question. And again, we're going to do the same style of the analysis. First, I'm seeing that methanol that I have over here, that is a poor base in the nucleophile, and also that's a polar product solvent. We have a secondary position for our alkyl halide, so and uh, since we don't have any elevated temperature or anything of that sort, it pushes us towards the SN1 reaction. Mechanistically speaking, this reaction is quite involved. Once we have our initial living group dissociation over here, we're going to make a secondary carbocation. But that secondary carbocation is right next to a tertiary position, which means that the carbocation rearrangement is going to be very likely. And once we have our tertiary carbocation that we get via the hydride shift over here, we're going to end up with a more stable carbocation. And in this particular example, it is already as stable as it can humanly be, so we are not going to expect any further carbocation rearrangements. Then we are going to have a nucleophilic attack from our nucleophile, which is methanol in this case, giving us the protonated intermediate looking like this. Since protonated intermediate is not going to be the stable final product that we want to get in this reaction, we are going to use either methanol or Br- as a conjugate base floating around in our solution to deprotonate it, and it really doesn't matter which one you use. Statistically speaking, it's more likely if we use CH3OH for this reaction, but just as likely we can use Br- for the stoichiometry's sake. So our final product here is going to be this molecule over here. In the next question here, there are a couple of interesting moments that we are going to have to point out. First of all, the OCH3 over here is not a living group. That's not a typical living group that we normally see, so we're not going to consider that. So the only living group that I have is actually the iodine over here. Further, my reagent here is the base slash nucleophile, so it can play either or role, but since we have a secondary alkyl halide, we have a secondary position for our living group, the most likely mechanism here is the E2 mechanism. And although we have a polar product solvent here, as I've mentioned in my previous video, the solvent is merely a facilitator of the reaction, and it's not going to usually determine the mechanism of the reaction. So although we have it here, here, it doesn't really change the fact that we still have E2 reaction, although E2 reactions don't necessarily want to see the polar product solvents. 
Going through this mechanism, first of all, I will have to identify a couple of protons that I have in the beta position. I have the beta position over here and I have the beta position over there. So I have my hydrants A and B. I do have the hydrogen A on the dash, so I don't need to worry about the antiperiplanar positions or anything like that. I already have the hydrogen in the antiperiplanar position, so hydrogen A works just fine. And in this case, what I'm going to see is the possible formation of two double bonds. Those two double bonds are not the same. If I look at my top double bond that I got by eliminating hydrogen A, that double bond is connected to two other non-hydrogen substituents. If I look at the one on the bottom that I got from the hydrogen B, well, that one is only connected to one non-hydrogen substituent. And in this case, if I can choose, I'm always going to choose the bond that is going to have the most number substituents, which is going to be the most stable. So that is what we call a Zaitsev product, and that is going to be our major product in this particular reaction. Here is the next question. In this question, we have sulfuric acid, which is, well, it is acid, so by definition, it's going to be a poor base in a nucleophile, and we also have heat. So when we are reacting alcohols with acids in the elevated temperature, that is essentially a classic recipe for the E1 reaction. And in this reaction, if we go through the mechanism, the step number one is going to be proton transfer to make our OH into a better leaving group. OH by itself is not a good leaving group in acidic conditions, so first we have to protonate that. After that, we have our leaving group dissociation, and once my leaving group pops off, we form a tertiary carbocation. That tertiary carbocation is unlikely to rearrange into anything else, simply because we do not have anything more stable than this tertiary carbocation that we could potentially make. So, the next thing that I'm going to do, I'm going to look at my beta hydrogens, so I have a couple of beta hydrogens, those HBs, which are exactly the same, and I have my hydrogen A, or proton A, on the methyl group over here. So those are going to give me two different products. And like in one of my previous examples, I'm going to look at the substitution at my double bond. The one on top is connected to two non-hydrogen atoms, and the one on the bottom that comes by eliminating hydrogen B is connected to three non-hydrogen atoms. So because of that, the one on the bottom is going to be the major product again, because E1 reactions, they typically favor the formation of the Zaitsev product, the most substituted product in all cases. So in this reaction, if I look at my reagents, what I'm going to see is that, first of all, my reagent is a base and a nucleophile, and I have a secondary benzylic position for my living group. All of that is going to push me towards the E2 reaction. But here is something very important. First, for the E2 reaction, I need to find the beta hydrogens, and the only beta position with the hydrogen is going to be over here. But if I look at that hydrogen, that hydrogen is not antiperiplanar with my bromine. Both hydrogen and the bromine, they both are on the dashes. So if I were to construct the Newman projection, looking from the left side, for instance, that's what I'm going to see. And this is an eclipsed conformation. So what we want in this case is this bromine and this hydrogen to be antiperiplanar to each other. And in order to be able to have them in antiperiplanar conformation, I will have to rotate either the front or the back atom of this molecule. So let's say I'm going to rotate the back one clockwise, which will now put my hydrogen and bromine in the antiperiplanar position. So now I will be able uh, to make a pi bond in between them. And once I do that, what I'm going to get is a picture something like that. Now, this molecule can be a little bit difficult to picture because essentially I'm looking at it straight ahead and I'm seeing that pi cloud. But if I start turning it a little bit, that's going to look like this. So first over here, I have this side view. And if I clean up my molecule a little bit, that side view turns into this nice structure. And notice that in this structure, I have my phenyl groups being trans to each other, just like what I see in my Newman projection and what I see in my 
side view over here. The other one where the phenyl groups are cis to each other, that molecule is not going to be formed because the transition state and the Newman projection where the hydrogen and the bromine group dictate me that the molecule has to look in a certain way uh, for the final product. All right, so in this question, we have LDE. And what we know about LDE is that is a very bulky base-only type of reagent. So since this is a base-only reagent, I'm probably going to be looking at the E2 reaction. So for the E2 reaction, I need to find all the beta positions to my leaving group and assess whether I have hydrogens there or not. So I have this beta position this beta position and also don't forget we have this methyl group over here as well so that is also a beta position to our iodine so because of that i have my hydrogen a hydrogen b and hydrogen c that i can analyze to see whether they are going to be able to give me my product or not and if i do so i'm going to see that ha works because ha is on the wedge while my iodine is on the dash, so that works without any problems. HB is not going to work because HB is on the dash and there is no way we can rotate the molecule around or change the conformation in any way or form to make my iodine and HB being antiperiplanar to each other. And finally HC, since that's just a methyl group, can easily rotate around and there will be a conformation in which HC and iodine are in fact antiperiplanar to each other. Now, one thing that I've mentioned at the very beginning of this question is that LDA is an extremely bulky base. And that part is very important because due to the fact that this is a bulky base, we are going to favor the less substituted double bond known as a Hoffman product because the bulky base has a lot of hard time uh, pulling off protons from the middle of the molecule. So the bulky bases like LDA or terbutoxide or anything of that sort, DBN, DBU maybe, all of those guys are going to go after the least sterically hindered hydrogens, which in this case is going to be hydrogen C. All right, here is another interesting question. And if we analyze this question, we can see that we have a poor base in a nucleophile acidic condition. So in acidic conditions, we cannot have any good base or a nucleophile. So it pretty much automatically going to give us a poor base in a nucleophile conditions. We also have an elevated temperature in this reaction, which means that we are pushed towards the formation of the elimination product via the E1 mechanism. Looking through the mechanism, we see that in the first step, we're going to form a carbocation over here. And notice that although I have a small ring which has a lot of strain, the secondary carbocation in this case is unlikely to be rearranged simply because it is next to another secondary position and the primary position. Since carbocations do not have long-term planning skills, they don't know that after a couple of rearrangements, they're going to be more stable. We are not going to have any rearrangements here because what it sees immediately, there is no gain, no gain, no rearrangement. So in this case, we can get two possible elimination products, one by eliminating the proton A and another by eliminating proton B. Since this is an E1 reaction, we are going to be looking for the most substituted double bond. And in the green case, in the case of HA, that going to give me a double bond with two substituents on it. While in the blue case, in the case of HB, I'm going to get a double bond with only one non-hydrogen substituent, which means that the top molecule is going to be my major product in this reaction. And finally, here is the last reaction here. If we go through our normal route and analyze our reagent, what we will notice is that the terbutoxide, because of how bulky it is, is going to be a base-only type of reagent. However, in this case, we only have one carbon in our substrate. That's a methyl substrate. So although base-only reagents typically give us elimination products, in this case elimination is physically impossible. Because of that, we're going to have to have an SN2 reaction. So the final product in this reaction going to look something like that. So did you get all the products correct or did I catch you on any of these reactions? Let me know in the comments below and did you find this uh, walkthrough helpful? If so, leave this video a like, subscribe and hit the notifications bell so you don't miss any of my future tutorials and I'll see you in the next video.